We're here today at Fiera USA in Fresno, California, and I want to introduce you to Brendan Black, who has also been on Egg Spotlight before, and um, he's here. This is his his home area and where he goes to school. And um, so, why did you come out to the show? Well, actually, it was because of you. You invited me uh, out to this show, so I had the opportunity to come out here uh, and get a media pass to uh, go around and interview people. But just like you, you are doing right now, I'm looking for networking, uh, networking opportunities and more uh, potential interviews for my own podcast, Talk Ag to Me, uh, as well as just to learn some new things about what's going on in, in the tech world so I can bring it back and, and teach other people about it. Awesome. And tell us a little bit about your podcast. Yeah, so my podcast is called Talk Ag to Me, like I mentioned. It's an agriculture education-based podcast, uh, entirely intent on connecting the agriculture industry and the general public, uh, kind of bridging that communication gap, helping them understand a lot of the misconceptions that are out there, and uh, bringing kind of more modern look to agriculture, so that way they think that we're more than just a farmer wearing overalls and a pitchfork kind of thing. Right, that's great. And um, so since you've been here at the show, what have you been learning, and what are some of the cool takeaways? I've been learning that there's a lot more to agrobotics than I initially thought, um, which I, I'm pretty dialed into the ag technology world, but it's just so advanced and it's developing so quickly that it's so hard to keep up with everything. Uh, there's a lot of big challenges facing technology right now, you know, and, and a lot of issues that technology can solve. The problem right now is just that it's not advancing fast enough to solve some of those issues, and it's advancing too fast to solve other issues. So it's kind of like finding that balancing act of using technology appropriately while still making it uh, profitable for the farmer. You know, like one of the conversations that was had today is the balance of, you know, is it making yield or is it saving money, you know, and, and whether or not those products are usable for the farmer or if they're going to be usable, you know, five or ten years down the road. So uh, it, it's been really interesting to see not only what new innovations are coming out, but the kind of the thought process going into designing these new technologies and how they're going to be used in, in the in industry, not just today, but, you know, for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. Absolutely. And, um, you have some uh, interesting projects in the works. Do you want to uh, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So uh, this is partially to go, uh, going into my master's project for uh, my, my uh, master's degree at school, but also a larger scale project that you're actually helping out with uh, that is uh, at the moment called the California Ag Literacy Initiative. It's going to go through some changes, probably go, go through a name change at some point. But the very basic premise is bringing together uh, ag industry people, ag literacy people, ag education people, uh, and general public, uh, you know, people to talk about better ways to have conversations between the ag industry and the general public. Uh, similar to how my podcast serves as a bridge of communication between those groups, I think that we should all kind of work together to find better ways to have those conversations and, and you know, more appropriately distribute that information. So the main goals of the, of the team are uh, collaboration, communication, and uh, action. And so collaboration is more so based on bringing together the people already in the industry that have the ideas and helping them actually communicate with each other, kind of building a network of sorts uh, between ag communicators and ag educators and the ag industry uh, and then the the communications obviously with the public actually presenting our message to them and the action is is coming together in the form of whether it be conferences or just simple meetings or communication uh, through kind of some kind of network uh, there's been talks about potentially starting a website um, and then you know you and I have been talking about the potential of creating a uh, kind of a roundtable event similar to what you've done in the past on, on your show that would bring together consumers and producers to discuss those issues and clear up those misconceptions so it's, it's very much in its infancy I'm going through research phases right now kind of identifying the key uh, issues we want to cover but I think large scale and, and long term it could potentially grow into something much more uh, impactful on the relationship between the producer and the consumer. Yeah that's that's awesome I'm impressed at how far you've been and how much research you've done um, looking forward to our meetings coming up and and good job and thank you so much for joining me right now. Yeah thank you I always appreciate talking to you. <laughs> awesome thanks. Yeah. This is a carbon robotics laser weeder, the first and only uh, laser weeding machine. It uses a combination of computer vision through cameras, AI, and deep learning to spot weeds live in, in real time. And then we use extremely high-powered lasers to burn the weeds out of farmer fields. Um, so this machine here is an example of our autonomous version. And then the commercial version is a three row, so three times the size pull-behind pull tractor implement that gets its power from the tractor PTO. Uh, we've been selling these for quite some time now. Um, they've been selling really well. People seem to like them, very uh, productive, doing great. Um, and we're really excited for what we've been able to do working with growers. Uh, these machines work primarily on vegetable crops. So we're talking about salad crops, um, broccolis, cauliflowers, lettuce, spinach, that kind of thing, onions, carrots, you know. And uh, so basically anything that we can drive over 
and any weeds that we can see, we can shoot. People like them for being able to plant really dense because we can get in between anything. You can see some videos on our website of some uh, weeding in really dense spinaches and things like that. And uh, yeah, Carbon Robotics Laser Weeder. Is Colt, Stout, Farmwise, all cut the weeds out with the same principle. We use blades behind the machine to articulate around the plant. So they open, they close, they cut, they open, they close, they cut. So with the Colt machine, Colt press, I introduce Kim, introduce Daniel. These are our uh, German partners that you will have just come from the Nile machine where you'll have seen the uh, Colt fingers or the weeders on that machine as well. So that was a collaboration between the three companies to make sure that we were getting the best technologies on the platforms that customers want. All right, so what you just saw coming out of that machine is similar to what you're gonna see here. This is a bigger platform, standard tractor mount platform. So for the growers that have high acres that are doing production, these types of machines are what they're using today. So we've got, all these machines are being sold all over the United States, but you'll see them up and down the coast and in Arizona working every single day. Daniel, will you do me a favor and lift that hood up? And while he's doing that, my name is Nick Copas and I'm Keith with a company called Keithley Williams. We are primarily a seed company. I run the equipment division. What we do is try to marry the best technologies in the industry together so we can bring solutions to the growers. Let me stand out of your way here. And by bringing the technologies to the growers, what we want to do is, is have the highest benefit values for them. That does one thing for my company that sells more seed. They lead the way and I just pick up the, the back end of it and bring the stuff out to the growers and try to make them happy. So Colt has uh, engineered this specific piece of equipment and underneath here, I know it's kind of hard to see, but you'll see that there's two bars. We've got the main toolbar in the front with a rear toolbar. And that rear toolbar shifts side to side. It goes left to right. So when the camera system's picking up the plant line, in that plant line, it's following the plant line. So if you do not have a straight plant line, that machine's gonna move back and forth to make sure that the blades are centered over the plant. That way we eliminate being able to cut plants out instead of weeds out. I think that's good. On this model that you see here, and this is, I'm going to set this down. On this model here, we've got the, uh, the cab camera and uh, computer system mounted in the rear. So that way, if you follow behind it, we'll be able to see what's going on inside or under the hood. This traditionally would be put into the cab. So the operator has the ability to make changes on the fly. If he wants to position the knives a little more forward, a little more to the rear, he thinks he's getting too close to the, to the plant, he has the ability to control that. He can also move the machine left and right from there. So this device gives him complete control in the cab, but for today's demo, we just have it mounted in the rear so everybody kind of can get a visual of what's going on as the machine is moving. So I think with that being said, is there any questions before we get started? All right, Kim. So the camera system is now finding the plants, it's identifying them, and centering itself over the line. Daniel's probably going to make a little bit of depth control as we go because the beds are wet, and we sink a little bit in certain areas. This field is full of a lot of grass, which is not traditional to most people's fields, but it's going to cut that grass out nonetheless. As you can see, the blades are opening and closing around the plant line, just like you saw with the Nile machine. I'm here today with uh, Praveen Penmetza 
from Monarch Tractor, and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about what they do and why they're here at FIRA. Hi, I'm Praveen Penmetsa. I'm the CEO and co-founder here at Monarch Tractor. At Monarch Tractor, we are bridging the gap between farm sustainability and farm profitability. So with our all-electric autonomous tractor, this really allows farmers to decrease the emissions on the farm, but also be more profitable by saving money on diesel and also being more efficient with the labor that they use. And that's what we are doing here at Monarch Tractor. And what we have done is built a 40 to 60 horsepower machine uh, that can be used by any small farmer the world over. Our first market is vineyards and orchards, and we have signed up some of the largest growers in California and the western region of uh, North America that we are delivering tractors to later this year in 2022. So we've been involved with FIRA since our very beginning. So we've actually done some of the virtual events during COVID where we saw, you know, we did the event in France. And uh, FIRA is actually a, a, a great uh, coalition of existing equipment companies, startups, right, that are also doing a lot of robotics, and also companies like ours, which are already out there with our machines. And it really brings the growers, the technology people, and the existing equipment and implement companies and the data companies all together at one single show. So we are thrilled to be here and uh, looking forward to being more engaged in these kind of events all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we live in a very supply constrained world these days, uh, number one, right? What that means for growers is growers are facing huge amount of challenges on the inputs that they have, right? They're all being trying to be even more deliberate and careful with the amount of chemicals, water, um, and inputs that they're putting into the farm, number one. Number two is equipment has been hard to come by. So it's been quite challenging for the growers in this environment uh, to actually conduct operations. But the, the great thing about where we are and how we are working with them is to showcase what technology can do for them in reducing those input costs and also the fact that we are a new equipment company that they can place an order today and get tractors, you know, in, like in the early part of next year is a huge benefit to the farmers. And farmers definitely want to see and try. And I think if you ask me about a challenge, I wish I had more demo tractors to do more demos with farmers uh, around the country here. Uh, one of the advantages we have is we're supported by some very large ag equipment companies and some very large manufacturing companies as well. You know, Case New Holland, our, our strategic partner, and an investor in Monarch Tractor, right, has been supporting us on the supply chain side. So we have the mass of uh, Case New Holland behind us. We also have Foxconn, one of the largest contract manufacturing companies in the world, right? They have a huge, they are the highest uh, and the largest employer of people on the planet. So the fact that they're building our tractor in Ohio means that we can leverage their relationships to get the supply chain components that we need and keep manufacturing tractors so that we can get them out to farmers' hands as soon as possible. So again, I encourage everybody to check out our site, monarchtractor.com. And also, by the way, you know, we're taking reservations on our site, so do check us out. And also, there's incentive programs from the states and uh, federal governments, including the USDA, that will make our tractor even more easier at a lower cost for you to get your hands on one of our tractors. Identify him, and then continue to follow him. It'll work on him. Identify him, and if I walk in front of it, it will still stay on him. It'll stop for him the same way it does every time. And as he walks around, it'll follow him around like a little puppy dog. Some people ask, all right, so what is that good for? Have you been on a tractor? And you have to come up to a gate, you gotta hop off the tractor, walk through the gate, hop back on the tractor, and see driving. You can now do that, but it said, just be off the tractor.
I don't usually use a mic, and my voice from yesterday talking to everybody is, is pretty pretty tired. I am the CEO of 1-3 Design, and, which I no longer am. I just sold. I'm now the CEO of Avis Bauer. 1-3 uh, Design was a, a product development team that started out putting together a fully electric, fully autonomous tractor, and has now branched off into Avis Power. Avis Power is, is about an 80 horsepower each left track right track is driven by its own independent motor that's a 40 horsepower motor and the pto is also a 40 horsepower motor we use three independent motors for our our drive system um things to know about it we've uh, been working on this for about two years we have two different versions even though about 95 percent of the parts are the same this version is a 60 inch row spacing um, we can set it up for different widths, whether it be 80 inch uh, vegetable beds or whether it be 60 inch or 48. Our narrowest unit is more of a vineyard tractor. We lower the center of gravity about 150 millimeters down and we narrow it down to a 1.25 meters or 47 and a half inches. And um, as far as that, uh, I want to introduce Rhett Shildroff. He is actually a minority owner as well as a supplier. He's been a, a great pad. He manages all of our software through Red Shield Electronics. And the vehicle has RTK positioning, but it also has stereo optics to do obstacle detection as well as enhance the stereo or the drive when we lose our RTK. Uh, under canopies in the orchards or whether we are in a, a vineyard that's very heavily covered with canopy. Other thoughts? Uh, yeah, so there's a tablet interface so we can see where it's going, plus remote control for manually driving it. It does, on the front of it, have a stereo camera plus radar that's doing obstacle detection, which means everyone has to move out of the way or we're just going to see it sit here and say there's an obstacle in front of it. So if we could, if you, would you like to start the demo now? I, I'll start the demo. Yeah. Oh, yes, there you go. All right. Is it the start button? It's clear. Please stay clear. And again, as it goes, you can circle in and watch it go, but you don't want people out in front of it. It will stop repeatedly. It's going to move to the, the start point, set its hits to where it needs the hits to be placed, and then start going down the road. What you're hearing is cooling fans. Everything's liquid cool. Brad Abraham, I am our uh, field coordinator. This right here is Curtis Gardner. He is one of our co-founders. And um, this machine right here is our machine. Uh, we are Vernon Robotics, and what we do is we use machine learning to detect crop from weeds, and we spray the weeds out in organic crops and instead of having hand crews come in and remove them by hand. Uh, the same, the same technology that we're using to spray weeds, we could take that technology, we could use it in many different ways, we could move it in different directions. So if we're spraying the weeds, we could also shift that model around and we could lay out some minute fertility on top of plants, or we could do plant growth hormones, we could do insecticides, we could do fungicides, you name it. We kind of do the same thing across the board. Um, what makes this machine unique is, uh, is our application type. Uh, a lot of the other machines you'll see out here, they're either using lasers or e-tools or things like that to remove weeds. We are more on the biological side of things. We think that spraying um, the, the organic chemical down does a very good job. Um, we're spraying with millimeter type accuracy. So when we're going through fields, I'll just kind of lay out a scenario for you because we run in a lot of carrots. Um, when we're running in carrots, carrots come in anywhere from 40 to 55 carrots per bed foot. And so within those 55 carats per bed foot, <clears throat> you also have <clears throat> 
25% of the plant density in there is going to be your weeds. So uh, what we need to do is we need to get between carrots and spray weeds out without killing the carrots. And so what our machine does is it goes in and it sprays those weeds without killing carrots. And so um, we, whenever we calibrate our machines in, we sit between anywhere from two millimeters to four millimeters of accuracy. So um, it's pretty cool. Um, Christian, I don't see him over here. He's one of our operators. He was calibrating the machine the other day and we had a bunch of ants running underneath our machine. We just had water in it at the time, but just to see how accurate it was, he was sitting up in the tractor and he was spraying ants on the screen with our sprayers across the whole thing as they were moving. So um, when we're going through fields, this thing is working at a, an accuracy level that we haven't really seen in agriculture since I've been in it in my 15 years in agriculture. So um, the value that we're creating for the growers really stands on uh, the, the hand labor that we're removing out of the field for them. A lot of organic crops that are grown here in the valley, um, you can't, there's no, uh, there's no herbicide that could go over the top and specifically kill just the weeds. And so a lot of the farmers in the areas are using hand labor to go out there and do that. So um, for our economy and for our industry to be able to grow and scale, there has to be a more efficient level of way of doing that. We don't have enough hand labor here in the United States to, to hand weed the fields we need to be able to scale organic farming in, in, in this state. So what we're doing is we're going in and we're mitigating that to start. And our goal is to eventually make a machine that is so good and so easy to work with that we'll be able to take the hand labor that is picking weeds in the field, pull them out of the field, put them in a better living condition, a better working condition inside of a tractor and have them start running our robot for us in those fields. So um, that's the basic gist of uh, what we do and how we do it and why we're driven in that direction. Um, we all come from farming backgrounds. I Curtis ran the largest tomato operation. As an operations manager for the world's largest tomato processing facility, so uh, did uh, harvesting and transplanting for roughly 40, 50,000 acres. We got Sal over there, he's still still with the company, so hopefully he has some questions for me. And uh, just been in ag uh, for a long time, worked at uh, a very large family farm, 12,000 acre diversified row crop farm. Went from 14 crops to 21 different crops, uh, both organic and conventional production. And so a lot of fun, but it was there when I saw the, the change in the regulation. So SB3, minimum wage going to 15 bucks at AB 1066. Um, Ag exemption of overtime going away is going to roughly double the budget uh, for hand uh, labor on the farm. And so kind of threw my hat in the ring and was lucky enough to, to found Vernon with uh, some other folks. Most of the folks that we have come out of the self-driving car industry. And so this is really just applying that self-driving car technology, but to agriculture. So it's phenomenal to get people from other industries in to help us solve the problem so we can uh, keep the commercial viability of farming in California. Um, what's happening is that this machine is working. This machine, you can see this machine in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Czech Republic, soon in Hungary, and very soon in California. This machine is working, is only working for the vine, and is doing intervine for the moment. So the tool is to do weeding only. We're working on uh, many other tools like uh, mowing, like trimming, like uh, spraying as well, that should, that should come very soon. But this is the machine now that we have. Uh, maybe, maybe we can make you a small demonstration. So it has four batteries, 60 kilowatts. It runs between eight to 12 hours a day and it takes only two hours to charge with our supercharger. Many in Europe compare it to the Tesla, but we have a good after sale service. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's uh, autonomous. Um, this machine can be sent during the, if you consider the, the law and the European law, this, uh, you cannot, you cannot leave the machine working alone. Okay, this machine has to be supervised. 
look after. One person can look after one, two, three machines at the same time. If you have a closed property, it's legal in Europe to leave this machine working alone. Meaning that you can launch the machine, it does the job, you go to something else, you come back later. As you can see, it works autonomously. We have all the safety on this machine, human animal detection. So I just met this gentleman here at FIRA. Uh, his name is Matthew Barron, and I'm going to let him take over. I just had my first podcast. Yeah. Um, it's about uh, New Mexico and the people that occupy New Mexico and all the interesting people. And the things that brought me there were the pandemic. And I stayed there for a long time uh, donating food to disabled veterans there, uh, a program called Kitchen Angels. And so I was just there last Friday and, uh, you know, gluten-free, homeless people, gluten-free, disabled people, they're my, they're my people, right? So uh, I love that kind of small piece of, of uh, charity. <clears throat> and so as the pandemic started happening, uh, food banks started failing, right? So not only were they not getting natural, healthy foods, but they were also getting like small supply and then they didn't have the people to make up the meals so all throughout the southwest it was just a train wreck when the pandemic hit right and so i said hello let me give you you know a hundred a thousand pounds of some of my food and in trade put me on the website you can think as a marketer the value of that yeah. right being on a food bank website so i did maybe 17 food banks throughout california texas New Mexico, Utah, right? The more, the more desperate they became, the more useful I was, in a way, because wow. I have a warehouse full of food. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm in uh, nuts and dried fruits and seeds. Uh, I work with uh, businesses, but also individuals who are looking for wholesale amounts, uh, 25 pound boxes, pallets, all of it, right? Um, and the more that they, they order or are interested in, the closer it gets to the farmer. So I can call the farmer, they can wrap it up for me, the processor, it's a, it's a great system of, I can get as much as needed. So the first part is, is that it's in California. So I wanna say about 50% of the products that I sell are actually in California. Uh, you're talking about pistachios, you're talking about uh, almonds, you're talking about uh, raisins, um, I mean, all those things are made here, right? So any chance for me to connect to a farmer in person and get them to see the kind of customers I have, those people that are between the supermarket and buying a container, those are my people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of easy to do one or the other. It's easy to buy a container and it's easy to go to the market and buy like an eight ounce bag. Wow. So I'm trying to fit in everything in between. Um, and to connect those customers to farmers has been the greatest delight, right? When someone asks what farmers is coming from, I'm like, oh, well, let me give you their phone number. You can chat with them. You know, let's make a time where we can chat. You know, the, the key is, is to treat farmers with respect for their time, especially. And so you don't let a customer just run through and ask them a bunch of questions, right? They can answer all the questions they want about, uh, you know, uh, toxins or about um, spraying crops or whatever. You know, some customers really need that information, right? Others are just curious. They just, their mind goes a thousand different directions. Mm -hmm. I heard this, I thought this. So it's nice to be that space in between. Right. It's really great. Um, there's a lot of really interesting kind of farming techniques as the future kind of grabs hold. So there is, um, you know, having certified organic crops in the middle of a field of inorganic crops. So they'll spray a circle like a donut. And in the middle, they have certified organic crops and those they sell for double. Right? So they do that in Pennsylvania, where I'm from. Okay. Right? And then there's other ways, which is uh, drone technology, so that the planes don't fly over 
uh, non-organic certified land, right? But if you're in a plane with wind, it's a huge problem, right? For pecans in America, throughout the Midwest, they're just used to throwing planes over these things and spraying crops. And they just miss all the time because they're traveling at 200 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I love the new technology, right? I love the idea of drones, kind of capturing that space and bringing it down. I love the idea of kind of what's going on with automation. Um, and I think that'll lead to more jobs, lead to more people doing what I do. Um, you know, I think that's really just uh, important. So you were recently on a podcast. And um, can you tell me about that podcast and where people can find it? Uh, so it is New Mexico Biz Talk or NM Biz Talk okay. with a Z, right? They like to really squeeze the Z's in there. Uh, so it's NM B I Z Talk, and I'm going to be the first guest with many to come afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really excited about the food guests they have and food in New Mexico. I mean, they have a battle that's been raging against red peppers versus green peppers. Really? It's re green salsa and red salsa forever. Mm -hmm. um, and just feeding all those people, right? Mm -hmm. It's a landlocked state. Yeah. So it's just surrounded by desert. And uh, it's beautiful there, enchanting. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. Look forward to hearing it. And thank you so much for joining me. And thanks for your time. Thank you so much for having me.